This is my take on Panasonic's new Lumix GH3 camera. I've had it a couple of months and used it extensively because I wanted to get to know it properly before talking about it. This is a radical camera for the M43 market because the designers have firmly put handling and usability before physical size. Olympus upped the ante with their OMD, yielding image quality that threatens to make crop sensor DSLRs redundant. That meant that if you wanted significantly better image quality than the OMD, you really needed a full frame outfit. Panasonic's GH3 image quality doesn't improve on the IMDs, it's much of the same. The GH3 doesn't make any other large steps forward either. It offers a string of additions, improvements and tweaks that in combination add up to a camera that even a grizzled old ex-pro like me recognises as a thoroughly serious, even professional tool. To achieve that, Panasonic have sacrificed what to some was the main point of M43, namely size. The GH3 is a bit bigger than Pentax's K5, for example. Was the sacrifice worth it? Well, to me, it isn't a sacrifice. Experience with my GH2 Panasonic and a bit with the OMD led me to want a bit more body real estate. There are many things I want to toll on and off. The histogram is a good example. I want to switch it on, check it, and then get rid of it. There are others, like manual autofocus modes and drive modes, that I like to be able to see what is set. What impresses me most with this camera is the thoughtful way the layout has been designed. Panasonic have been listening to their users and it does show, but how does it stack up in practice? To start with, the size. Any camera is a combination of body and lens. When I sold my K5 DSLR, it wasn't the body size or weight that was the problem, it was the lenses. To make my point, the GH3 with the two f2.8 zooms covering the 24-200mm to range weighs in a little over half that of a small and light DSLR like the K5 with equivalent lenses. When you are cycling or walking, that bulk and weight saving is a game changer, but that's enough about the size. Compared to the GH2, the image quality is better, about on a par with the Olympus OMD. I never had a problem with the GH2 IQ, but less noise never comes amiss. I rarely shoot above 1600 ISO, and on this camera you really don't see much noise until about twice that. While on performance, the dynamic range has improved over the GH2 as well. The camera body is on a light magnesium frame and is weather protected. Basically, with a weather protected lens, this camera is starting to feel like a professional item. It feels solid and reliable in the hand. I like this camera from the moment I picked it up. It feels right, it feels solid, everything falls under the finger. Especially with the two f2.8 zooms, it feels like a picture-taking tool. A few random observations. The shutter is quiet and smooth, almost like a whisper-like. The battery can be changed without removing the tripod quick-release plate. There is now a proper sync socket for studio flash, no hot shoe adapter needed. The lens release is now a long bar instead of a small button making lens changes quicker and easier. The rotary dial around the menu which replaces the four buttons of the GH2 can be used for parameter adjustment and moving around the menu. Or you can use the touch screen which feels like a high-end mobile phone in its responsiveness. I find myself using all of these according to circumstances. They are all intuitive to use. Carried over from other Panasonic M43 cameras, the screen pivots and, importantly, can fold to face into the camera. No need to worry about scratching if you just bang it in your bag. The viewfinder and screen are a matter of three steps forward and one back. Forward, they are sharper and more contrasty with richer colours than the GH2. And there is hardly any shearing or smearing when you move the camera rapidly. Personally, I think it is better than most DSLR optical finders because it amplifies the brightness under dim conditions, so you can always see what you're doing. Manual focusing is a cinch. All in all, a very good finder and screen. The step backwards is that the sensor is no longer oversized as the GH2's was, so when you change aspect ratio, the lens angle of view changes. But, more importantly, the eye-level finder image is smaller. It is brighter and more vibrant, but it is noticeably smaller. So, on a GH4 wish list, GH2 size, GH3 quality. I'll reconsider my step backward remark though, three steps forward and half a step back. An important addition is Wi-Fi. 
I've done a separate video on this, so suffice to say that the tethered shooting with iOS and Android devices is excellent. Loads of control and possibilities. It's more limited with video, though. Uploading your pictures to PC, Mac, Lumix Club, Facebook and the other facilities seem underdeveloped and a hard way of doing simple things, even if you do manage to get it working. Ditto the GPS tagging via your mobile phone. It works, but you might prefer to sticking pins in a map. Now let's look at some detail. It will be some detail. There are countless facilities and settings, so I'll just run through the most important in my opinion, and then show you how I have mine set up. You'll note that I often have the accessory battery grip fitted. I think it improves the balance and feel of the camera, as well as adding portrait mode shutter release and another function button to toy with. My view of battery life is simple. Too much is not enough. The battery grip doubles what is already a healthy 500 plus picture taking capacity and removes all potential tension of a shooting capacity from a shoot. Potential, tension, electricity, sorry. My basic technique for setting up is very simple. I get everything set as I want for stills and then assign it to the C1 setting on the program dial. I'm not suggesting what I do would suit everyone or is best, I'm just saying it covers my needs. Aspect ratio I set to 4.3 because I find it the most pleasing to my eye and it also has the highest pixel count. I always shoot raw. It's the nearest I can get to my old film negatives and I never touch the raw files, doing all my processing non-destructively in Lightroom. I use aperture priority because I will then always know what is going on. If I use shutter priority I can set a shutter speed that the lens cannot match to its aperture and so the camera amends the shutter speed, making nonsense of my shutter priority setting. I set the white balance to auto, but it doesn't really matter with RAW, since you can alter it post-shoot. On the other hand, auto is pretty accurate normally, so it minimises the intervention. I set ISO to auto with a max of 400 for best quality. If I want a higher ISO, I change it manually. The beauty of the custom settings is that when you switch the camera off, it reverts to your basic settings, so you always know the state of the camera when you switch on. And you can revert to your standard settings anytime just by switching off and back on. I set the AF-AE lock to AF lock only and to hold AF lock until switched off. I set function 1 to toggle the level horizon indicator. F2 is left on the default quick menu. Function 3 to the autofocus mode, tracking, pinpoint, etc. Function 4 to toggle the histogram. Function 5 to switch the electronic shutter. Function 6 and 7 on the touch screen I don't use at all. The function button on the battery grip I use for switching the Wi-Fi on. I set the sequence shooting burst rate to M because that retains a full view of what is going on. I set the rear thumb wheel to change the aperture setting and the front one to directly set the exposure compensation. With that done, every time I switch the camera on, the only thing I need to change is the aperture if I wish. Now for a few observations. There is so much that this camera can do that it's a bit overwhelming when you start going through the menus. One menu item I want to point out is the monitor and eye level finder display style on the custom menu. If you set it to display the icons outside the light view area, to keep the viewing area uncluttered, it doesn't do this by moving the icons, but by reducing the size of the viewing area. It's a significant reduction and led me to being a bit underwhelmed by the new viewfinder. Until I cottoned on that the view area was a lot bigger if you had the icons inside it. You can hide the icons anyway, so there's no real downside. Where lenses are concerned, the GH3 feels like it was made to work with the 12 to 35 and 35 to 100 f2.8 zooms. It probably was, in fact. They match and balance one another beautifully, they're a very, very satisfying combination. There is decent time lapse built in and high dynamic range too. The electronic shutter is a nice addition. I'd assume it uses less power than the focal plane shutter, but it is also silent. You can add clicks to it if you want. I wonder if anyone will make customised sounds so that when you fire the electronic shutter, it sounds like a Hasselblad, say. It does have limitations, one of which is that for technical reasons it distorts some moving subjects. The ones I show here are extreme examples, of course. 
The autofocus, especially with the F28 zooms, is lightning fast, instantaneous virtually, and even in dim light it locks right on. While I'm on focusing, if you set touchpad focusing on, you can activate and move the focus point from the rear screen while viewing through the eye level finder. The uses for that don't become apparent until you start using it. There's a good time lapse facility built in. You can shoot enough frames to give you over 5 minutes of video. So you can shoot one frame every 8 seconds to compress 24 hours into about 5.5 minutes. Great fun some of the things you can do with this. A little bit about video. The video settings on the GH3 are wide ranging and an advance on the GH2. They are probably beyond what I need. The GH2 already is. But I'd like to know that whatever video I might want to do, the camera will do it. I especially like the improved control over audio and the standard size mic and headphone sockets. A little bit of future proofing. So, some conclusions. If this review seems a bit bitty, it's a consequence of the nature of the camera rather than my butterfly mind. There's no giant leap forward here, rather a raft of improvements, additions and incremental changes. But the sum is greater than the parts. For me, the GH3 is the M43 camera I've been waiting for. It's capable and feels the real deal. I'm pleased the Panasonic went this way, putting handling above size, because Olympus have taken their opposing tack and sacrificed the multiplicity of external controls to keep the size down. Panasonic haven't moved M43 sensor design forward. In one respect, the sacrifice of the oversized sensor of the GH2 is a stumble backwards. But they have matched the Olympus sensor, so buying decisions can be made on almost the same basis as the old film cameras. Image quality is a given. Which camera can I best live with? It means that M43 users have a choice of two superb cameras able to share lenses, yet following different design philosophies. Makers are more often inclined to copycat, but these two, whether by design or accident, follow different paths. The beneficiaries are us, the M43 photographers, and long may it continue. Thanks for watching.